All right, well, good morning again, everybody. Thank you for that response. I appreciate that. <laughs> A little slow. Must have been decaf out there. Uh, no, we are in the March Madness. It's interesting. You see the different sides of people's personality. You ever notice that? Like all of a sudden they become en uh, enraged as a cat fan or a card fan. So it should be a lot of fun for us. I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, vision this morning. And as all of you all know, we just completed the second part of our Vision Louisville strategy. It really is the most critical part because it was from the ground up. We received more than 80,000 ideas about how Louisville will look, feel, and flow in the next 25 years. And the ideas were all over the map, uh, literally, and that they came from every corner of our community, and then touched every corner of our community at the same time. But they were also all over the map figuratively, ranging from solid and practical ideas, for instance, we need more hiking paths, more bike paths, but to the more whimsical and unexpected ideas, like zip lines across the Ohio River. Wouldn't that be fun? But one thing united these ideas. Everybody who participated envisioned a city that was a great, dynamic, 21st century city. One that competes both in quality of life and quantity of opportunities with cities all over the country and all over the world. And that was true whether we were talking about a swimming lake in Portland, that would be very cool, which technology exists for, or more waterfront housing, or tearing out the Ninth Street Divide to make it a place for the community to come together. Lots of work being done on this. So by profession, as you all know, I'm a business person and I'm an entrepreneur, so I evaluate these kind of shifts with a really key question. Is Louisville improving as a place to live and work, as a place to attract more opportunity to our community? And I ask this question not only obviously because I live and work in the community and grew up for most of my life here and I have a lot of friends and neighbors the same way, because from a business person's perspective, this type of growth is actually vital for us to move forward and to attract the best talent in the world. A lot of you all know Jim Welch and Jim is Brown Foreman's vice chair at a downtown forum that he recently spoke at. He discussed how important quality of place was to Brown Foreman when they're recruiting talented employees from around the world. Uh, not many people are going to uproot their families from Hong Kong or Paris to move halfway around the world for a job alone. Not today, obviously, because those type of people have high demand skills and they want to be in a lot of uh, different places and have lots of options. So if these folks are going to move halfway across the world or across the country for that matter, they have high expectations for their new home. And this dynamic is not just a factor with Brown Foreman, uh, but it is with Humana, it is with Heaven Hill, it is with Kindred, it is with each and every one of your companies at the same time, and it certainly holds true for our city as a whole when we recruit the best talent from around the world. So we have to address a changing dynamic that I mentioned briefly earlier, and that is people no longer follow jobs, jobs follow where the people are. So let me give an example. In Oklahoma City, uh, the voters have done a lot to improve their city and their livability in the past couple of dec decades. And they did that in response to a message they got about jobs following people in a real hard way. Here's what happened in Oklahoma City. About a decade or so ago, United Airlines turned down a sweet best in country tax incentive package for a United maintenance facility because the United Executives said, and they told this to the mayor at the time, they just couldn't imagine their employees living in Oklahoma City. That's an ouch, right? And that really hurt them. And that was tough for Oklahoma City to hear. But they said, we're going to do something about this. They started investing in their waterfront, in their schools, in their neighborhoods. And now people come from all over the world to their US Olympic rowing center that was created from what was basically a, a slow-moving creek in the middle of the city. They now have a ballpark, a convention center, new trolleys, a new music hall. They invested in themselves. They created their future. So Oklahoma City, Nashville, Austin, Indianapolis, these are the medium-sized cities that we compete against every day. And these are also cities that are making rapid improvements in their built environment. 
because they understand quality of place issues and they know this is the way of the future. People increasingly live where quality of place is high. And people are looking for the entire package. It's not just the built environment. It's good schools, arts, reasonable cost of living, beautiful natural environment, friendly people, public transportation options, international, global city, and certainly a modern, diverse, built environment. So where does that leave our city? As I mentioned earlier this morning, we've got to move faster. The truth is we're not investing fast enough. We've got a lot of assets in our city, but we've got to up our game if we want to compete globally with medium-sized cities. And I say medium-sized cities because we're not going to be a megalopolis of 10 million plus uh, people, not in any time in the near term. But we will be competing in that million and a half, four million uh, population-based cities. So the expectation that I get when I talk with all of our citizens, and I'm sure when I would talk to you all, is say, yeah, we want to be one of those great 21st century cities. One where jobs are plentiful, our kids and grandkids have a lot of uh, opportunities pursuing rewarding careers, we can live healthy and active lives and raise our families in a city of opportunity and progress. That's what we want. That's what I hear. And this is not a new thing for our city. As a community, we've always had to make these kind of quality of place type of investments. Where would, we be, where would we be today, for instance, if city leaders had not invested in the Olmstead Parks or Waterfront Park or the Parklands at Floyd's Fork? What if we had not invest, invested in our airport and our logistics network? And these things just don't happen, right? People make them happen. The community makes them happen one citizen at a time. And historically, we've invested in these type of projects through state funds, uh, federal grants, gifts from private donors, uh, tax money, bonds, etc. And these aren't bad options, but some are not as readily available as they once were, and none of them are nimble and independent enough to be our only tools moving forward. Take a, uh, an example here, Waterfront Park. It's now recognized as a global best practice, and we love it. I'm sure you all have spent a lot of time at it, as I have. It took nearly 20, or excuse me, ne nearly 30 years from concept to completion for Waterfront Park. The world is not moving in 30 year increments anymore, okay? Gotta go faster. And our competitor cities are moving faster than that. And to be the best, as I mentioned earlier this morning, we can't compare just ourselves to ourselves. We've got to compare ourselves to the best cities in the world. So you got to have tools. It's like a business, right? You want as many tools as you possibly can have. And, I, and if you all are tired of hearing about the local option, throw things at me and I'll stop. Uh, and this is the reason why when people say, why are you so insistent on this local investment for transformation or lift? as an important priority for our city is because we've got to have tools to invest. And Lyft is about local control, letting people vote on specific projects, and it's trusting us as a local community to make investment decisions rather than trusting state-level politicians to make the right investments for our community. And I don't know about you all, but I'm a lot more comfortable with us as a community voting rather than just waiting uh, for something to happen in Frankfurt, or in many cases, us having to go to Frankfurt to beg for things to happen. So it's about local control. And you've heard me mention this many times before. Uh, the local option is an optional one cent sales tax that we can vote yes or no for. It'll be for specific projects that are identified on the ballot with how much money they would cost, so we'll know in advance how long the tax will be in effect, and then it sunsets when it goes away. And we're talking about a good, percent, a good amount of money here in Louisville. A 1% sales tax generates between 100 and $130 million a year. So that's about the amount all of Waterfront Park cost. So imagine if we had a project the scale of Waterfront Park, and it may not be a park itself, but of that scale being completed in our community every single year. It would be a renaissance in our built environment over the next decade or two that would be news all around the world. So as an example, if voters, if it was on the ballot and voters chose to, we could pay for the remaining portions of the Louisville Loop and our two remaining regional libraries in one year. One year. As I mentioned earlier, it's going to take us 15 or 20 years to cobble together various pieces of funding to do that without the local option. 
So the question is real obvious for us as a community. Are we, are we okay just kind of getting by, or do we want to play to win? Do we want to say we, invest enough, we believe enough in our local community that we need to invest more and we should be able to vote on it? Again, I use the business analogy. It's as if somebody would come into your business and say, guess what, you can't invest in any capital equipment for now on, but we still expect you to be best in world. Well, the reality is that's not going to happen because your competitors are going to make smart investments with returns on those investments, and ultimately that's going to catch up with you. That's the situation we find ourselves in because we don't have the ability to have the local option by state constitution. We're making progress, but we're really in the final week or two to see whether or not we're going to get the right to vote on this. Lyft has passed out of the House Committee. It did last week. The question is now whether or not it will be voted on the, by the rest of the House. It's really up to Speaker Greg Stumbo. Uh, this is a proposal with bipartisan support from all over the state as well geographically. And by two to one, Kentuckians want the right to vote with the local option. So I know you all got a little card with an 800 number on it. Uh, please call your legislator today, both your senator and representative, and let them know you want the right to vote. If you disagree with me, please don't call them, okay? <laughs> But the time is now to get this done. And 37 states already have this option, folks. It's not like we're splitting atoms here, OK? This is not rocket science. So please uh, step up and ask your friends to do it as well. If all of you all had 10 people, uh, call somebody, make a heck of a difference. So in closing, uh, we're off to a good start as administration. We're in this three years. I'm going to run for another term of office. Uh, and so we should have a good, uh, steady pathway in front of us. Uh, and we've done things well in the built environment. Our job growth has been good. We've regained all the jobs that we lost during the recession. We were one of the first cities to do that in the country. Last year alone, more than 12,000 jobs were created. I don't do that by myself, but we helped create the conditions for that. 42,000 jobs we lost during the Great Recession. Those have all been regained at the same time. And now we're focusing on the type of job that we want to create a job based on innovation and higher wages at the same time. So you can read all about this in our progress Louisville report that, is, that are spread around the facility as well. And we've also got a couple other really big announcements. Uh, last week, or the week before last, the big project downtown is the 600 room, four star luxury hotel, the Omni Hotel. 200 apartments, we'll share the amenities of the Omni, then we'll have a 30,000 foot downtown grocery store for the first time in a long time, which a lot of people are excited about, including myself. So this is something we've been waiting for for a long time, and it's happening now because a series of investments that the community has made are starting to pay off. And you're starting to see the Bourbon Trail really come to life as well, which is bringing a new type of tourist to town. Well, they come and stay for two or three days. They go out on the Bourbon Trail during the day. They come back and go to one of our globally award-winning restaurants. They hit the urban bourbon trail at night. They drink responsibly and get up in the morning and go back and do it again. <laughs> so this is all coming together because of a plan. And while we had 600,000 visitors on the bourbon trail last uh, year, we are quickly approaching 1 million tourists a month that we haven't had before. So this is good for business. That's right. So the question before us as a community right now is, what are we going to do next? Are we going to say, eh, things are pretty good as they are right now. Is it good enough? Or are we going to say, no, we need to invest more. We need to play to win. I say we play to win, and we get out there, make the investments, keep moving our community forward, be entrepreneurial, and be one of the great cities in the 21st century. Thank you.